All right, well, it's time. Uh, so welcome to the um, Maybe Builder Lecture Series. Um, so thanks to the generous support of the Minerva Foundation, we're happy to have a series of talks uh, every year. And this year, Peter Schulte um, from Max Planck, uh, Max Planck Institute Bonk, um, is going to deliver three lectures on real local language as geometric language on the Twister P1. Um, so Peter's been here before, and in particular, um, almost exactly 13 years ago, so on March 22nd, 2011, <laughs> in a workshop uh, to, for um, Gala representations and automorphic forms, um, for which I think two of the organizers at least are in the audience here, um, he gave a talk uh, called Perfectoid Spaces. And then right after that, Jared Weinstein gave, another, gave a talk, and that was perhaps the first time that um, it was realized that perfectoid spaces would be useful in the language program. And so today, you know, 13 years later, we get to see, you know, what has come of that. So. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks. Yeah, it's a big pleasure to be back in Princeton. It's my first trip to the US since five years. And yeah, I'm excited to be here. I can report that I was pretty nervous when I gave the talk 13 years ago, and I can report that I'm again pretty nervous. So. <clears throat> Uh, all right, so uh, the title of the series is Real Local Langlands. As geometric Langlands. Uh, on the twist topy one. Okay, so I guess I'm giving a series of three lectures, which means usually that the first talk should be very colloquium style, and then I should uh, should get more advanced as I go on. Um, I will slightly break that rule and start by trying to give like uh, the big picture, which will probably be not very comprehensible. Uh, so for the first 20 minutes or so, uh, bear with me, and I will just try to lay out the ground, and then after this, uh, I will uh, build it up more from from the ground. <clears throat> All right, so, so so what's my goal in these lectures? Um, my goal is somehow to convey what my current understanding of like length corresponds over the real numbers. And I want to understand it in a way which is very similar to how I currently understand the local language correspondence of the periodic fields, which is based on this idea that Laurent Farc had uh, pretty much exactly 10 years ago, that you can realize this as a geometric language on the Farc Fontaine curve. Um, so let me just give a very, very sketchy uh, account um, of this periodic story, just to sort of set the stage. Um, <clears throat> all right, so yeah, I guess in the Langlands program, you're interested in representations of some reductive group. Uh, so let's pick some um, over QP now. And in order just to simplify my life a little bit, uh, let me assume it's split. It's not really essential for anything, but. Um, <clears throat> so then, um, classically, the local language correspondence seeks to give a parameterization of the irreducible representations of the locally profiled group G of QP um, in terms of what are called L parameters. Uh, and more recently, it was realized that you could hope to not just parameterize the irreducible objects, but really try to describe the whole category in Langlands dual terms. And so the, the form that this takes in the PID case is that, um, well, to get a clean statement, it's better to pass the derived categories, but basically, I mean, you look at this category of smooth representations uh, of your PID group. And let me suppress a choice of coefficients. It's, Something like maybe the complex numbers, maybe secretly the allotic numbers. Um, and uh, something that was suggested is that this should embed fully faithfully uh, into something that's somewhere on the Langland Steel side, um, which is up to a very small i uh, that I will just ignore for now. The derived category of product career and chiefs uh, on the stack of L parameters. Uh, so uh, the stack of L parameters, uh, that's some 
Martin stack actually in this case, so it's some kind of algebraic stack. It's really just, basically it's just a quotient stack of an affine scheme by a reductive group. Um, and essentially it's of, of like L parameters. So of these are like continuous maps, continuous representations from the way group of your uh, local field QP uh, towards the dual group. Minus dual group. <clears throat> um, a conjecture of this form surfaced sometime around 2020 by and some of, several people independently. Um, so for conjecture of this form, there, there's a work of Eugen Hellmann, there's work of Xin Van Ju, and then there's a paper of Ben V. Chen Hel Nadler, where they actually uh, prove a version of this conjecture for the unipotent law. <clears throat> but uh, here some of the, the representation theoretic side is smaller than the spectral side. And well, it turns out that there should actually be a way of rectifying this and um, like build something on the representation theoretic side that exactly matches this up to very minor things. Um, and this introduces a much more fancy object uh, in the picture, which is some kind of derived category of sheaves on some stacks that I will just call bungee. Uh, and <clears throat> basically these should be equivalent, which is a conjecture uh, that you can basically find in my paper with small fog. <clears throat> So what is this bungee here? Um, <clears throat> this is a moduli space. Uh, of G bundles. On something that behaves much like a smooth projective curve. So this would be the setting that's usually started in geometric Langlands that you have a compact Riemann surface or something like this and then study the moduli space of G bundles, bungee. And then they, in geometric Langlands, they formulate conjectures of precisely this kind of sort. <clears throat> um, but now instead of a the smooth projective curve, you, you use the fog from 10 curve. <clears throat> Which is an object that Falk and Fontaine uh, introduced in around 2010 uh, in Pierre Koch theory. And <clears throat> uh, okay, let me say just two things about the setup. Um, one thing is that this embed, like contrary to this embedding, which is supposed to be something very difficult to understand, this embedding here is extremely simple un to understand because you just geometrically have an embedding of the classifying stack of this locally profinite group into the stack bungee. It's just an open substack <clears throat> of some of the trivial G bundles. Uh, and so you can just extend, like sheaves on here are basically just representation of the group. And so you can just extend them by zero and then uh, gets the function. Um, you already see that something a little bit weird happens because usually when you have a modular stack of G bundles, it would be rather the classifying space of the algebraic group that appears, but here you will get the locally profinite group. Uh, the other thing I want to say about the setup is that these bundles on the Falk von Tank curve, <clears throat> they're basically giving you some notion of a variation of Pierre de Koch structures. So this picture is related to the theory of variations of pierre de structures. All right. Another thing, physical exercise. Okay, and so uh, the goal of this lecture series um, is to explain a similar uh, picture um, in the, in the, with the real numbers. Yeah. <clears throat> 
Um, so now, of course, I need to you know, fix the group G over R. Again, say reductive split. Um, and so basically, I just want to write down obvious analogs of all these things. Uh, so let me just write them down. And then, then let's wonder whether this makes any sense. Um, so what people study, like in real local languages, is basically representations of these, this real group. So you would hope that there is some kind of derived category of smooth representations of your real group. Um, <clears throat> and then you would also maybe hope that, uh, again, you can write down some stack of error parameters. But I mean, classically, real parameters are now representations of the real way group uh, towards your group. <clears throat> and again, you would hope that you can complete this diagram uh, by making also the representation theoretic side larger, uh, by also having some stack bungee here, which hopefully uh, is equivalent <clears throat> to the category of career chiefs on the stack of L parameters. Uh, where this thing here should now be of a very similar form. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, so somehow what Falk and Fontaine realized is that in Pierre de Koch theory, there's this way that you can understand these variations of Pierre de Koch structures in a helpful way is using some of uh, these families of Falk Fontaine curves. And an observation that maybe goes back to Simpson is that there's this very similar looking story over the complex numbers where variations of complex thought structures um, can also be thought of in terms of uh, families of vector bundles on some kind of twist or P, families of twist or P1. So there's this whole series of variations of twister structures. And so this is supposed to tie into this. So this is supposed to be something like some modular space of G bundles uh, on the twist or P1. where these should have something to do with very, which, some inclination of variations of twister structures, which are some generalizations of variations of hot structures. <clears throat> that group that you're talking about now, are they all R linear? Uh, very good question. They will probably all be complex linear now. I mean, so first of all, if I ever, 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 ever have, want to have an interesting representation theory, of a real group, then I cannot act on an abstract Z module or something like this because then the discrete topology and they, they don't mix so well. Uh, so I def definitely have at least the real numbers as coefficients so that I can have a nice notion of continuous representations. For a technical reason, I will actually at first have to work over the complex numbers and then the, uh, let me not get into this. Uh, it is however, a very good comment. Uh, it reminds me that I should say that I've been trying to find uh, this kind of analog here basically since uh, Park made the suggestion um, for a very long time unsuccessfully. Um, <clears throat> but then suddenly uh, during the House of Trimester program in Bonn last summer, uh, it all fell into place. And the reason it fell into place were discussions about the corresponding periodic analog where you consider periodic representations of periodic groups, uh, which turns out to be much, much more similar to what can do with the real numbers. And these were discussions I had in particular with uh, Johannes Anschutz, Artis, Cesare Bra, and Juan Esteban Rodriguez Camargo. <clears throat> I will, however, try not to talk about the case of periodic representations of periodic groups here because it will take us too far apart. But really, uh, a lot of it, what I'm talking about this week, is motivated by, by that story. The group, so classically, they, they pass to so called Arishandra GK. Yeah, that's okay. Do you do it and you, you identify things with the same GK? Yes, let me come to this. Okay, so there's all sorts of problems in making this precise. Like the first being that even the things that you think you understand best, like it's clear that maybe this corner of the diagram is a bit mysterious and we'll need to come to that later. But you might hope that at least these two pieces are, are uh, things one understands reasonably well. Um, but it turns out that even like having a good theory of just representations of a real group is actually a subtle thing. And usually people pass through our Chandra modules in order to get rid of all sorts of issues in functional analysis. Um, so here we are attacking the functional analytic issues inherent in talking about representations of real groups. 
<clears throat> and I will come to this more detail probably tomorrow, but I will start discussing it today. Uh, the other thing I should mention <clears throat> is about the stack of L parameters. So there would definitely be some sort of stack of L parameters where you just represent right representations of this real value group. However, it does not at all have the right topology for there to be such, uh, such a correspondence. Um, the issue being that like the elliptic parameters are isolated in the moduli space, but representation theoretically you see interaction with uh, pure and super series representations. Um, and so again, let me discuss it later. So Vogan uh, somehow had uh, found a way to, to, to address this. All right. Um, <clears throat> before like starting to discuss what this, like, right, ah, okay. So, uh, so things I want to discuss. Uh, so the first is like here <clears throat> uh, to introduce some kind of good category of representations uh, of the real group. Uh, the second thing I want to discuss <clears throat> is related to this notion of L parameters. Um, so some, I want to discuss some good in the space of L parameters. <clears throat> then, uh, right. <clears throat> so then, and then there's some of this question of at all relating the representation theory and these L parameters. And classically, the way that, I mean, okay, the, the, the way that it's done in all situations except for real groups is that you use a cohomology of some space. Uh, so usually you have uh, the cohomology of some, I don't know, algebraic variety, and you have both some maybe a delic group acting and, but also on the Italic cohomology you automatically get these color symmetries and these two commuting actions are what mediate a Langlands correspondence. Um, the problem is that it's very hard to like get a representation of the veil group as as the analog of the Galois representation on Italic homology. Um, and so uh, this is, turns out to be also related to what you have to do here. So let me write the third point here. Um, so there, there will be some uh, new perspective on this notion of variations of twister structures. And this will be used in at least two ways in this diagram, or maybe not in the diagram, but uh, one thing that it was, will be used for is to get some cohomological realization uh, of, of the law of L parameters. Um, <clears throat> And another thing that I want to use this for uh, is to give it a, a new perspective on much of Schema's formula. So tying in the story of, uh, so much of Schema's formula describes uh, like the cohomology of Schema varieties in terms of automorphic forms. Um, and so I want to discuss a version of Matsushima's formula that in particular also takes into account the Hodge structures. <clears throat> um, right, and so then the, the last thing is like this thing. The Langland Cialti conjecture as an equivalence of pedigrees. Yeah. <clears throat> 
All right, so this is uh, what I want to cover this week. Um, before starting, let me give some uh, indication <coughs> of what the geometry is that is in the background in this whole periodic story. So, uh, so uh, which is actually ex tying it back exactly to this talk uh, 13 years ago uh, about perfectoid spaces and the Lubin Tate Tower. So, so, the, so the periodic geometry behind. is in the simplest uh, case something like the following. Um, <clears throat> so there is this thing that you can take the projective line over CP and you can find over it a canonical GL2QP torsor. Um, which is called the Lubin Tate space at infinite level. <coughs> um, so this parameterizes, roughly speaking, super singular elliptic curves with a full level structure or something like this, or really super singular PW groups. Um, <coughs> but it turns out that this is in a non trivial way isomorphic to a different, a very similar looking moduli space called the Drinfeld space at infinite level. <coughs> and this one, is in a very similar way a torsor now under D star, where D over QP is a, are the periodic quaternions. So non split real form uh, of a two by two matrix algebra, um, which lives over a Drinfeld upper half space over P1 CP minus P1 of QP. So this Drinfeld's periodic of a half space. <clears throat> uh, so this isomorphism go, goes back to work of Faltings and then was clarified first in work of Fark and then following up somehow on what happened uh, during those talks, somehow in my work during work with Jared Weinstein. Um, it is, however, it, it took a long time for it uh, to be formalized in a nice way because these are some highly infinite type spaces because you have this torso and this huge locally profinite group over some usual rigid space. So there's some highly non Euclidean space. And uh, what it actually is then is, is a perfect lot space. So you need some rather fancy periodic geometry uh, to make sense of the objects intervening behind the scenes in this diagram up there. <clears throat> and so over R, you would thus expect uh, to have some interesting diagram of the following sort. Um, like you would expect that there is some interesting way of taking like the projective space P1 over the complex numbers, then having some kind of torsor under GL2 of R uh, over it uh, by, uh, I don't know, something, which should be isomorphic to something. Um, and that thing is supposed to be at the same time a torso now under like the usual quaternions. Quaternions. Um, now over uh, the usual upper, well, upper and lower half space, so P1 of C, one of P1 of R, also known as upper and lower half plane. <clears throat> and well, to some extent, you can just write down something like this as a pure laser topological space. Uh, but it seems pretty boring. Um, but also in this diagram, you realize that like, these two things are things that are living in very different worlds. So this is really meant to be some kind of more rigid quantity variety, more or less algebraic. Uh, but this is meant to be just a locally profinite group. Um, and so over the real numbers, you get very confused because like, okay, this is maybe supposed to be a complex manifold, which you often also just think of as maybe a smooth manifold with some notion of well, the bar operator or something like this. And you have the GL to R, is it just a topological group? Is it a, I don't know, real analytic group? Is it a smooth kind of group? What is it? Um, so all of these things have now many possible interpretations and they actually all play a role. Uh, so. Uh, yeah. Thank you. 
So, um, so, so there is a problem that we need to distinguish between something like the complex numbers uh, as, well, it could be a complex manifold. It could be a real analytic manifold. It could be, I don't know, it could be just a topological manifold. It could be just a topological space. What else could it be? Oh, let's, let's, let's take those incarnations. Um, <clears throat> so something like the complex numbers will appear in the geometry I want to do in, in extremely many different ways. And I need to uh, be able to distinguish them and they need to interact in non-trivial ways. Yeah. And all these incarnations need to interact non-trivially. Need to interact. Um, so thinking purely about this story over the real numbers is like you're in a hall of mirrors because everything looks the same and it's extremely easy to get lost. Um, so that's why it was extremely helpful to first sort out the similar periodic story and then uh, translate. Because in the periodic story, you can really see the difference between these different incarnations. And so, uh, just to give you an idea, uh, for one something that should happen. So let's let's mark the star. So here is uh, some example application that we want to draw from from this diagram, showing that it must actually be something interesting must ha must happen. So the star will be used. Uh, to turn, let's say, a discrete series uh, GL2R representation pi <clears throat> uh, into a sheave on the base, right? So whenever you have a space and a G torso on top, then any representation of G can be used to build a, a sheave on the base where all the fibers are just the representation, but the torso somehow twists it into a sheave. So this will be done in this uh, situation to turn this into, and actually it will be uh, variation, infinite dimensional variation of twister structure, so to say. Well, let's call it F pi. Oh, you won't see. And actually, the thing that there is a this commuting H star action is it, like purely on this diagram, there's an H star action here regarding this as a browser, a very variety of this. And this torso should be equivariant. So actually, there's some kind of H star equivariant. Guy, and then there will be a serum. Um, that if we take uh, and saying that I mean I can do it for any geo two R representation for the next year we will do it for um, you can take the cohomology groups yeah so so maybe I should say like all the fibers if you do this then you expect that somehow all the fibers of the sheaf are equal to pi but it's somewhat non-trivially twisted, which seems weird because P1 is simply connected, but never mind. Um, so you can compute this cohomology. And so now what structure does this have? Well, everything was H star equivariant. So you still have definitely a uh, remaining H star action. But then there's also this variation of twister structure direction. So it's this times a twister structure basically. Um, which will turn out to be 
in this exact setting right in, basically the same thing as a WR representation. <coughs> and so the thing you get is basically a representation, commuting, uh, representation of a product group of H star and the real way group. And then you can make your guess for what it should be. Namely, it should just be the Jackie Langner's correspondence for pi, which turns a GL2R representation, in particular a discrete series, into a representation of H star. And you tensor it with the local Langner's correspondence of pi, which is some two dimensional uh, WR representation. And so this gives you a cohomological realization uh, of, of the L parameter of pi. And this is extremely similar to uh, results that one finds uh, for periodic groups. And maybe the first theorem of this sort was proved by Deleen for GL2 of QP. And then there was a conjecture of Cariol generalizing this to GLN, which then was then proved by Harris and Taylor. Uh, maybe in a slightly different formulation, but more or less equivalent. All right, so this was meant to uh, set the stage a little bit of uh, like what kind of things I want to discuss uh, in these three lectures. Um, now, uh, let me start much more basically. So, um, so the rest of today, I just want to give some basic reminders about say the representation theory of maybe the simplest kind of as a SO2 or GL2 uh, of R uh, <coughs> uh, and the Langlis parameterization. And then like indicate which sorts of issues one runs into uh, in the standard uh, account of the story. All right, so we are, we are interested in um, <clears throat> I mean, in general, very much infinite dimensional uh, uh, representation theory of, of like these real Lie groups. Um, and let's for now say just GO2R. <clears throat> in particular, like the description of the irreducible uh, like classically, it's about the description of the irreducible representations. <clears throat> All right, so, um, yeah, the, the finite dimension representations. Also, which representations we have? But first of all, we have standard representation, uh, V. I mean, it's just R2 with GL2R acting topologically, or maybe let me choose as scalars uh, C2, uh, the simplest case. Um, then you can classify all the finite dimension representations. Uh, so these are classified by, uh, well, you can take a, a symmetric power of V for any n greater or equal to zero. And then you can tensor with a character. The character of 
GL2R, but it being a character, it's really a character of the XB being quotient, which is just R star. And let me also recall that these can be easily classified. Uh, so pi of X is the norm of X to some complex power times the sine of X to uh, either zero or one. <coughs> All right, so the finite dimensional ones uh, you can easily understand. Um, and then there are the infinite dimensional ones. Um, and the simplest kinds of infinite dimensional ones are the so-called principal series representations. Um, so uh, there's the following form. So you fix your standard torus, standard Borel inside of GL2. So these are any two by two matrices. These are the ones where um, the lower diagonal entry is here. Torus. Um, <clears throat> and then there's the standard procedure and representation theory where you start with a representation of the torus inflated to a representation of the Borel because the Borel retracts back onto the torus by forgetting uh, the unipotent radical <coughs> and then inflating, uh, in the, inducing up to uh, GL2. So let's execute that. <coughs> so I'll fix a character Pi, which will automatically be an exterior tensor product of two characters uh, of T of R, which is two copies of R star. Um, <clears throat> and then we can look at the induced representation from P of R to G to R of chi, or I mean, properly speaking, of the inflation of chi to the Borel. <coughs> And uh, what is this? So an induced representation is always, oh, by the way, uh, I'm extremely bad with science, in particular when it comes down to writing down an induced representation. There are so many choices to make that I will definitely screw it up. Um, uh, but up to science and left and right actions and so on. Uh, this is meant to be functions on, from GL to R to the complex numbers, <clears throat> which transform under uh, on one side, on the action of the Borel, y is a given character. So that, such that for all uh, b in the Borel, uh, g and g of r, <coughs> and let's say f of b times g is chi of b times f of g, and probably there should be an inverse, I don't know, um, <coughs> chi of bar maybe. Hmm? Right, so now, 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 now there comes a very serious question. Um, <clears throat> I definitely don't want to take all functions. I definitely want to at least, at least have continuous functions where something exists, but uh, so maybe you really want to have differentiable representations or something like this. So then, yeah, so there's a very serious question. <clears throat> Uh, which functions? I mean, actually, I said I definitely want continuous, but it's actually not quite true. Um, <clears throat> um, there's all sorts of things you could think about. I mean, you might think about just uh, just continuous. Uh, you might think about, well, actually, maybe I want some C infinity, uh, uh, some smooth functions. You might think that actually you might want them to be real analytic, which is often called C omega. Um, but sometimes you also think about dual representations and then sometimes you instead like to think it's actually better if it's some of the dual of smooth functions, which are distributions, often called C minus infinity. Or and sometimes you work in this setting and think about the duals, you rather think you should have so some of the dual of local analytic functions, which are called hyperfunctions. Uh, <clears throat> all of these things are maybe somewhat relevant. Maybe C0 is the one that's least, least used, but all the others are definitely used. Um, so, yeah, many choices. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> but one definitely has a strong feeling that there should be only one induced representation, right? So whatever the formalism is, like for each chi, there should be just this one induced representation and which function space you choose shouldn't really matter at all. Although of course it matters, but. Uh, Um, right, so the usual uh, workaround. <clears throat> um, so this is some of what uh, Harris Chandra introduced. <clears throat> uh, depends on a small choice, so you fix K in G of R, the maximal compact subgroup. And you restrict to the k finite vectors, the ones whose orbit under the action of this maximal compact is actually um, just a finite dimensional vector space. <clears throat> and then in our case, the maximal compact subgroup is basically an S1. And this, this quotient of GL 2 r by the Borel is also basically an S1. And so then basically by Fourier theory, um, these functions that you get, they must be just a finite direct sum of like the usual eigen, S1 eigen functions on a circle. And so these are extremely regular. Um, so in particular, they're at least real analytic. Uh, so, so this gives you a much smaller space that's, uh, than, than, this, than this one. Some of the, the K-finite vectors sit, sit even inside. Um, <clears throat> and if you restrict to the K-finite vectors, then you actually get some very algebraic theory. Then you get what's, what's known as a, as a GK K representation or Harashandra module. And their series are somehow very algebraic. Because the representation theory of a compact Lie group, uh, that's basically the same thing as the algebraic representation theory of reductive groups. Uh, that's very algebraic. And then you just have an abstract Lie algebra representation. So this makes it uh, convenient in some sense because you can completely ignore all functional analysis issues. Um, the drawback of this is that you don't actually work with representations of the group anymore. So you lose a lot of the symmetry that these representations are, are meant to have because we somehow fix this maximal complex subgroup. <clears throat> and so some of the first thing I want to really discuss in some detail, which will happen tomorrow, is a different way to like set up the basic theory, representation theory of a real group so that you do talk about representations of real groups. Uh, and still like for any character, you only get one induced representation. And then you can sometimes wonder which, which of these choices does it correspond to, and maybe the answer is it corresponds to the real analytic choice. Although in some sense it also corresponds to the hyperfunction choice, uh, in some sense simultaneously. <clears throat> All right, that's for tomorrow. Um, right. Uh, Uh, so yeah, so let me, let me quickly talk about uh, the irreducibility uh, of these. <clears throat> so for, for most characters, these are actually irreducible representations. <clears throat> but uh, sometimes they're not. Uh, and one can completely classify the situations where, they, where it's not. Let me just give one example. Uh, if you just take the trivial character, then um, this induced representations uh, <clears throat> is really just those functions that are invariant under the action of the Borel. And so these are just functions uh, on P1 of R 
is complex coefficients and GL2R is really just acting by because it acts on the P1. <coughs> And you see that there is now an obvious invariant vector because just a constant function C uh, uh, gives, you, gives you a subspace. And so you see that there is now like the trivial representation one sits inside of this induction of the trivial character one. And then there is some quotient, let me call it sigma. <coughs> and oh, the sigma is actually extremely interesting. So sigma is a uh, discrete series. <clears throat> and there's actually another choice that, that, that I want to mention, which is that if this is an exterior tensor product of the norm and the inverse of the norm, or it's inverse, I never know, um, <clears throat> then the induction of chi uh, actually turns out to be not functions, but distributions on P1 of R. Uh, so the dual two functions. Uh, so when dual to R acts, there's some kind of non-trivial uh, relation to this. And so here is something where you realize that maybe in this case, it's most natural to think of functions, but for this representation, it's most natural to think of distributions, which is one reason that you somehow don't really know whether you should rather take uh, C infinity or C minus infinity and so on. <clears throat> and so, so in this case, because it's distributions, uh, you can always integrate a distribution. And so you have a canonical functional now uh, to the complex numbers. And so this will mean that there is actually in this case uh, an induction that goes the other way, <clears throat> where it turns out that the sub representation that you get here is the same as the one that you got as a quotient there. And so it turns out that um, if you would really now look at the full list of uh, reduce, uh, cases where this induced representation is reducible, uh, this would uh, be one case for each finite dimension representation that we had. So for each finite dimension representation, there's a unique way kind of to embed an induced, induced representation. And then there is a cousin sum of this, which is a discrete series representation. So in this case, however, standard specification of discrete series representations would say that there are as many discrete series representations as there are finite dimensional representations. <clears throat> so. Specification of uh, discrete series for GL2R is that there are in bijection uh, with the finite dimensional ones. Now, here it's actually important that I use GL2 and not SL2. For SL2, there would be two discrete series representations for each finite dimensional. <clears throat> Some of this, this quotient, the sigma that would appear here as an SL2 or R representation, it would actually decompose into two pieces. <clears throat> all right, so, and this, these are all the, these are all uh, irreducible. Correspondence from finite dimensionals to discrete series two to one. Ah, because of the sign character? Ah, sorry. Yes, thanks. Uh, oh. Thanks, thank you. <clears throat> uh, right. Um, so maybe the more canonical thing to say is that there's a Jackie Langer's correspondence which relates this either bijectively discrete series representation for GL2R with the representations of the quaternions, 
which are all finite dimensional because the quaternions are basically compact. <coughs> uh, but for the quaternions, you don't see the sign character appearing because the reduced norm of any quaternion is a positive real number. All right. Um, all right, and so then there's a Langer specification. Um, <clears throat> so what Langlands observed is that you can actually canonically match up this list of, finite uh, of irreducible representations uh, with L parameters. Um, except for reducible representations. <coughs> uh, bar, uh, <coughs> with the L parameters, which are just uh, continuous representations from the real way group uh, towards, in this case, a dual group, which is again dual two, uh, now over the complex numbers. Um, so let me quickly also recall the classification uh, of these things, and then let's see how they match up. All right, so, so first of all, let, let, let's recall what the way group of real numbers is. Uh, the way group of R is a canonical extension uh, of the Galois absolute Galois group. Well, this one is easy enough to understand. Um, <coughs> by the complex numbers, <coughs> where uh, some of the Galois action on here is the usual, uh, is the usual one, uh, but it's not the same direct product. Uh, instead, one way to realize this could, would be a, as a subgroup of the quaternions, for example. Um, so you can write this as C star disjoint union J times C star inside quaternions. <coughs> so quaternions has one I, J, and K as basis vectors for this C is one and I, and then there's another J that we use. So this is one instance where I talk about this kind of uh, uh, cabinet of mirrors. Um, that uh, then there's another case where the quaternions kind of appear here and they already appear uh, maybe in Jackie Langlands and so on. It's, it's a bit uh, difficult to keep things straight. Um, so, but this occurrence of, of the quaternions is something completely unrelated uh, to this representation theory of GL2 R. Um, Right, uh, that's the real way group. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, this canonically uh, subjects well, onto the maximum Labian quotient, which is just R star. <clears throat> and there's some kind of norm map. <clears throat> and so now, um, in particular, it's easy enough to classify the, the characters of the Weyer group. Uh, they just correspond to, um, well, you know, characters of the real numbers, and these I already wrote that they're classified by one complex number and zero or one. And so, <clears throat> um, so there are some of the reducible L parameters. Um, <clears throat> so these are, uh, Call them psi one, psi one plus psi two, where psi i are some characters, um, so corresponding to some complex number s i and some sine epsilon i in zero one, <coughs> and then. Uh, there are the irreducible algorithms. Um, 
<coughs> and uh, there what you do is you start actually with a, a character of C star and then induce that up. Here's an induction. Um, and so all the, uh, the characters of C star classified. Um, <clears throat> so one way to write this is that phi of z is z to the lambda times z bar to the mu. Uh, whenever this makes sense, uh, so lambda and mu are supposed to be complex numbers, but in general, like exponentiation to a complex number is not such a well-defined thing. Um, what you can always exponentiate is, is the product. Uh, <clears throat> and then what's more difficult is a ratio. Um, <clears throat> but now this ratio z over z bar uh, will definitely have norm one, so it's an S1. So you basically just have to arrange that uh, this should here line by z. <clears throat> and if you actually want this to be uh, to not be a direct sum of characters again, you need that this character that you started with didn't actually factor over the real numbers, which means that on this S1 here, uh, it should be non-trivial, so you actually uh, we should ask that this is also non-zero. <clears throat> and then, uh, uh, roughly speaking, how things go is that like most representations are these principal series representations which just correspond to two characters, just like the reducible L frame we just correspond to. So these basically just correspond to the uh, irreducible principal series. Um, except that sometimes uh, this principal series representation ends up being reducible, uh, in which case it corresponds to the finite dimensional piece. Is compatible with permuting k1 and k2. Uh, yeah, sorry, yeah, so uh, 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 it's maybe a point I want to gloss over right now, but yes, uh, you need to be a little bit careful that if you do this naively, um, so there are some isomorphisms between induced representations. Um, basically, if you permute k1 and k2, you get the same thing, except it's not quite true because you need to put in the same twist as here. So you see that. For this one and this character, you almost get the same representation, and this is some of, in general true, and in general they are reducible, and you really get the same representation, but there's this twist that you need to make, so when you do this correspondence here, you have to insert a certain uh, twist. So there's some kind of, <coughs> more or less some kind of row shift as is habitual in this representation here. Let me make this explicit. <coughs> um, and these irreducible L parameters uh, they will be the ones that correspond to the discrete series representations. <clears throat> and then you can just uh, sit down and check that there's really a completely canonical way of building a bijection uh, with this idea in mind. And I think it would be more confusing and helpful if I tried to actually carry it out. <clears throat> um, uh, one thing I do want to however, note before I, I end in just a minute is that there is uh, something awkward going on here. <clears throat> Namely, if you look at not just irreducible representations, but really the category, uh, then you see that this discrete series representation interacts non-trivially with this principal series representation. So on the representation series side, Uh, the discrete series uh, interact, so they're non trivial morphisms, uh, with the principal series representations. <clears throat> uh, but when you look at the side of L parameters, um, 
then inside some of the moduli space of L parameters, these irreducible guys, they are basically isolated points uh, because there's some of this S1 inside of C star and some of the character of S1 is unchanged under deformations. It's just given by some integer that somehow doesn't change. Uh, so these, some of the irreducible L parameters, uh, they are isolated in the moduli space. Yeah, so as in irreducible L parameters and the reducible ones uh, uh, do not. Well, they sit in, I mean, there's an open closed decomposition of the moduli space of L parameters, irreducible guys, reducible guys, and they just don't talk to each other. Um, <coughs> uh, this is bad because it means that some of the, mo the, the, the geometry of the moduli space of L parameters does not at all mirror what you see on the representation theory side. <clears throat> oh. So that's, uh, one is forced to look, uh, one needs a different moduli space of air parameters. And some of this means you'd also need, in some sense, a different notion uh, of what an L parameter itself is. Although, like, the isomorphism classes in the end will still be the same, but, like, the underlying mathematical objects will be a bit different. It's a different notion uh, of an L parameter. And so, such spaces were famously uh, introduced by Vogan. Uh, and I don't yet fully understand how Vogan's parameters will relate to the replacement that I will introduce in this uh, series of lectures. But at least for GL2, I was able to check that some of the interesting degenerations that Vogan allows from a discrete series L parameter towards like a principal series L parameter, uh, that those families will also exist within the moduli space of L parameters uh, that I will use. <clears throat> All right, let me just stop here. Are there any questions? So, you, you didn't mention the Bancherel formula at all. Does it fit into any of your? Sorry, say that again? Bancherel formula. Bancherel formula. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's the problem about our representation. I don't understand at all. Uh, so, how do you know from your point of view that you have all the representations and all the discrete theories? So, something I want to discuss tomorrow um, is a version of. It is a version that came from our setting, and that's in some sense maybe cleaner. Um, <clears throat> where you can look at the category of representations with the same infinitesimal character as a trivial representation, and then you can prove directly that this category is equivalent to sheaves on like the complex vector variety mod the real group, but just Betty sheaves. Um, <clears throat> And then you just, in there, you have all the open strata. And for each open strata, you have like JLO shriek of one. And this corresponds to the discrete series representation. Yes. So, uh, so what's the notion of irreducible representation? One way to make it precise is using Alessandra GK models. Otherwise, if we do it as a representation of parallel spaces, we have problems like the invariant subspace problem. We need to Right. Clear what right. Well, I will have a completely different definition of even what the category of representations is. And then there, uh, these, these actually, these locally analytic somehow inductions, uh, the real analytic inductions will actually be irreducible. So I mean, I was talking about what formalism of representations of a group I will actually be using. Uh, it's, it's it's very different from the classical approach of how you would define it, and it's, it somewhat circumvents the usual functional analytic issues. Okay, if there aren't any more questions, um, we're back here at two o'clock tomorrow, and let's thank Peter again.